the Paul Leslie Interviews. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our pleasure to welcome our special guest. He is a pianist, composer, arranger, and band leader. His name is Gap Mangioni. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello, Paul. It's a pleasure to welcome you here. Thank you. My first question is somewhat open-ended. People have this definition of you, the pianist, the composer, the band leader. Who is Gap? Well, Gap came from an old Sicilian name, Gaspare, G-A-S-P-A-R-E. And when I was very young, my um, the kids that I would hang out with decided that that was too much. So we went looking for a way to shorten it. We decided against gas or gasp and decided on one, two, and four letters of my name. So that's where Gap came from. Now, in terms of who I am, I'm pretty, you know, simple. I'm a piano player, been that pretty much since high school. Traveled, recorded, I play a lot even now. Um, you can take a look at my schedule <laughs> and see that it's pretty much three to four times a week. And I, I, I do love it. I have to admit that it's the jo- one of the joys of my life. What was life like growing up? Actually, it was great fun. It was a very simple life. My father had a grocery store, and we the uh, living quarters, were, and it was attached to the house where we lived so that my father and mother were always there, although he was working in the grocery store for many, many hours a day. And we had a, a very close family life. We were hanging with each other most of the time. You know, if we were to play ball, it would be Chuck and me and somebody else. My sister Josephine was there as well. And when it came to music, it was often Chuck and me and some other people. So um, we loved it. You mentioned a, a sister. Was it just the three of you growing up? Yes. Was it a very musical home? It was. Even before we really got into music, you know, as a thing to do, my parents were, the radio was always on in the car, the radio was on always in the house, and it was usually to some sort of music. As I recall, um, when my folks, for instance, would have a party or something like that, they would literally roll the, the carpets back <laughs> in one room and turn music on the radio and dance. That was part of the, the big activity. My grandparents, who we would visit every Sunday, would would always have music on. And if it was Saturday afternoon, you would hear an opera, whether you liked it or not. <laughs> so, yes, it was a very musical family. I'm sorry, I should say in secondary terms, it was mostly people who listened to music. There weren't any uh, musicians in, in like my father's generation. And there certainly, well, one of my grandfathers played the trumpet a long time ago, but not to any extent, and certainly not while we knew him. Apparently, he did so as a young man. But there, there was nobody before us, and along came Chuck and me, and we got into it. What was the kind of music that you enjoyed the most? Was there a style or a band or a particular singer? Well, at the time, it, the pop music on that we you would hear regularly on the radio included Nat Cole, Frank Sinatra, the Basie Band, Peggy Lee, Ella Fitzgerald, Sarah Vaughan. <laughs> we were very wonderfully influenced in terms of you know just what we'd ordinarily hear on the air. And then my father started a tradition that and when we were really kids, I mean, we, we couldn't have been eight, ten years old. Every Sunday we would go to this record shop and we would get to pick out one record each per week. Now, we're not talking about LPs or anything. These were like you know, 45s. But we, we would really research what we were going to, to uh, buy every Sunday. And we got, got into some things that were fairly extraordinary. The um, store carried a lot of, oh, I remember Louis Jordan and, and uh, the Treneers and th- those sorts of early uh, R&B kinds of groups. So there was quite a cross-section. Was there a particular time when you realized that you were going to be a musician, that that was going to be your future? Actually, <laughs> I remember thinking, well, I'll do this until it doesn't work anymore, and then I'll get a regular job. Well, so far, so good. 
And I, I'm not sure about Chuck. He might have he might have been, especially since he he got into teaching uh, teaching music, he might have been more pointed toward a music career. But frankly, I I didn't I wasn't sure it would work. I was hoping you could tell us about the experience of having your father take you to hear the big bands. Ah, well, my father would take us to hear outdoor performances on a very regular basis. Uh, you know, we came from a very modest means in terms of the family income and all that. So we were mostly going to things that were outdoors and free. And he would he would take us to uh, places where big bands played. But we would also hear, you know, concert bands and gazebos on Sunday afternoon. I remember a number of Dixieland bands that we got to hear. But speaking of my father taking us to hear things, there was a time in, well, I can't remember exactly when it was, but we were pretty young. And my father had taken us to a nightclub on a Sunday afternoon. They used to do that. A group would come into town and play six nights and a Sunday matinee. He took us to the matinee, and Dizzy Gillespie with Sahib Shahab and Charlie Persip and Wade Leggy, just a, a wonderful group of, of musicians, played this really burning set. I mean, we were astounded by the, the playing that we had just heard. And my father, with Chuck on one hand and me on the other hand, walked us up to Dizzy and he says, Hi, Diz. My name's Frank Mangione. These are my kids. They play too. <laughs> 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 we, we were trying to find a place to hide. Right? <laughs> they play too. Well, as a matter of fact, Dizzy was the kind of guy who we got to talking to. My father was never a very shy guy. And by the time the next set came about, he actually asked us to sit in, and we did. And fortunately, we <laughs> were, were capable, even at a, a very young age. And Dizzy and our family became fast friends for the rest of his life. That's an amazing story. Yeah, well... <laughs> I was going to ask you about your experience as a house pianist for the Three River Inn Theater Restaurant. Yeah, there, there's this place. It doesn't exist anymore, but it, it was just north of Syracuse, New York, where I was at Syracuse University. And it was a, a Vegas-style nightclub restaurant, you know, with, with the stage and then the strip of the stage that comes down the middle of the restaurant, you know, much like you would find in a fashion show, you know, with that, with that walkway that can... And they would have, have really major entertainment there. I became the house pianist when I was at school. At the time that I was there, people like Sammy Davis Jr., Nat Cole, oh, there was a couple, oh, Jimmy Dean, yes, Jimmy Dean of the Sausages, Jimmy Dean came through. As a matter of fact, I, 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 when he passed away, I, I, I dug up a note where we had talked about my playing for him and all that. Uh, Teresa Brewer... You know, the, the heavyweight pop, about the only person who didn't play there of major note was Frank Sinatra. And they uh, they had called and asked him if he if he would play there. He says, sure. He says, I'll do it for half the house. He says, you mean half the ticket sale? He says, no, if I come and do a week there, I want half of the place. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but I remember the Sammy Davis run. He, he played, I think it was something like 17 days. It, it was It was a really long run. And got to be uh, at, at least acquaintances. We we were even had some major league poker games at the time, and some great music as well. What was he like? He was really a you know the kind of guy you would expect from having seen him on stage. He was chatty, hang out his his crew. He had a, a valet, and he had four or five musicians with him, among whom was George Rhodes a really wonderful piano player, but a great conductor. Who a conductor, And I could have been just set to the side <laughs> for that whole run because, I mean, George could have played the show himself. But he, uh, when it came to real estate, he says, uh, you know, you, you sit down at the piano. I did, and uh, it took a fairly short time for him to decide that he was going to conduct and I was going to, uh, to play the piano for that run. So we got to be uh, kind of friends. Uh, I, I remember all the funny things like Sammy showing off his quick draw with a, a, a substantial Western pistol. <laughs> Fortunately, it was never loaded. There wasn't much to do in Phoenix, New York during the day. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we, we, did, we did some good hanging out. 
You mentioned a lot of artists there. So throughout the course of your career, mm -hmm. who has stuck out in your mind the most that was especially thrilling? I mean, it's such a list. Sammy Davis Jr., Nat King Cole, amazing. Mm -hmm. Who would you say is the... Well, I failed to mention Tony Bennett and a, co <laughs> a couple of the others, Steve Lawrence and Edie Ed Gourmet. But I have to tell you the truth that the time that I was most knocked out on an ongoing basis was with Dizzy Gillespie. We met the time that I described and we um, stayed friends for a very long time. There, wa there wasn't a time he came near Rochester that he wasn't over to, to my folks' place for dinner and hanging out and all that. But I remember that the last time he played in Rochester, which is about a, oh, a year or so before he passed away, he called and asked if we would be his group for the, the engagement. That's still one of the very highlights of, <laughs> of my musical career, having my band play for Dizzy Gillespie, play, you know, as his band. Well, tell all the listeners out there about the formation of the Jazz Brothers. Well, let me see. I was on the road with a group called the Salt City Six, which was a Dixieland band, the first group that I ever played with. And Chuck was here in Rochester. The other people who happened to be here in Rochester, among the other people who happened to be here in Rochester, was uh, Ron Carter and Pee Wee Ellis, who you may remember from the James Brown Band. And Chuck joined them for this, it was a, maybe a one or two night a week jazz job, a jazz gig that they had, trumpet, tenor, piano, bass, and drums. And when I came back, I uh, joined the group on piano, and then Ron Carter moved to New York. It evolved so that very quickly we had five young, fairly able, especially for their age, but even not for their age, jazz players who were playing together a lot. I remember meeting Ned Adderley, and then in another story that is great fun to know, I remember that it was the night before New Year's Eve one year. We had heard that there was a um, a group in, uh, around the area, in the outskirts, well, like 30 miles away, but at a small club. So we went looking and drove to this, yeah, I can't describe how isolated it was. It was like a an old house that had become a bar and restaurant in the middle of some fields. I mean, fields where they were still farming. <laughs> I saw a bunch of cars. We went in and heard some incredible music. In the bar were a bunch of people drinking beer like they had worked hard all day. In the back where they served sandwiches and all that, I could, I could see people dancing. <laughs> but the, the music, incredible music, went back there. And there is like Philly Joe Jones, Paul Chambers, I'm going to forget the piano player's name for a second, but and Cannonball Adderley <laughs> playing in a club. So I naturally made a phone call, and within a very short time, we had 20 or 30 people, friends of ours, you know, who were there. And again, Cannon asked us to sit in, and we did. Later on, when Cannon called us to be on Riverside Records under his auspices, I asked Nat. I said, how did he ever decide on us? He said, he remembered you from that session <laughs> out, in the, out in the boondocks. That's how we got to be the Jazz Brothers, and that's how we got to have our first recording session on Riverside Records. I've read that your first solo album was the very first appearance, correct me if I'm wrong, of Steve Gadd and Tony Levin. That was my rhythm section at the time, yeah. They were both really young guys and were here at Eastman School of Music. Although Steve is from Rochester, Tony had come over from Boston. This was their first, to the best of my knowledge, this was their first recording session. We put a, wrapped a big band around that trio, and Chuck did some arrangements, I did some arrangements, and we put out an album called Diana in the Autumn Wind, which was very popular here in town and in this area at the time. And then far more recently, um, I guess about 35 or 40 years later, a number of major rappers have decided to use parts of Diana in the Autumn Wind of the Diana in the Autumn Wind album as basis for some of their raps. As a matter of fact, I don't know if these names mean anything, but Talib Kweli, Gorilla Black, Ghostface Killa, J Lib, and I can't remember all of them, but. <laughs> Uh, so apparently some fairly heavy uh, rappers have used pieces of my album. 
And the good news is that at the time we put it out, I pretty much self-financed it. I put a group, a group of people together and we underwrote it so that I own the album. Later on, having recorded for Mercury and, and for A&M and all, if they had chosen something from those later albums, it wouldn't have mattered because I didn't own the music, but I did own the, the music. We've come to have a nice relationship with some very successful rappers. <laughs> interesting. Very, very interesting. I wanted to kind of work my way back to the present and talk about your recent solo album. Okay. How did you pick the songs? Well, what I've recorded most recently is a, a group of mainly big band CDs. There's one called Planet Gap, there's one called Stolen Moments, and there's a Family Holidays CD. I did most of the writing on all of them. So that choosing the songs was just a matter of finding that which I had available or that I wrote for the occasion, which fit best into the format for the CD. And interestingly enough, I had Steve Gadd and Tony Levin as the rhythm section on a lot of it. I've heard a couple of versions that you've done of popular songs, mm -hmm. like, for example, Scarborough Fair. I've heard, like, you recorded Beatles songs. Oh, yeah, sure. There's an album called Stolen Moments. And it, that's mostly 60s music. We decided to make that the, the center around, we, around which we built the CD. And the 60s music was not only 60s pop music, but 60s jazz music. So that there was some Jimmy Heath music there. There was some Oliver Nelson music there. There was some music that I wrote back then. Then, of course, there were the Beatles and Paul Simon and oh, what's the other group? The Turtles? <laughs> I can't remember who did did some of these songs. but When someone listens to one of these records, like Stolen Moments, yes. or when they go see you perform live, what do you hope that the listener gets out of the experience? I hope they have a good time and that they find some enjoyable music to listen to. I try to discern from reaction of the people who are in front of me what it is that they've come to hear. And then, of course, I try to play it for them. We do performances as wide-ranging as the Rochester International Jazz Festival, which is a huge thing that, that's that been in Rochester for 10 years now, uh, with 180,000-some-odd people coming to it. We play mostly jazz-oriented things for that. On the other hand, Sunday night, next, we're playing a Jewish wedding. And you can imagine we probably won't play much jazz at that, but we do play music that people love to dance to. That seems to work out just fine. If you could put it into words, what is it you like about music? Oh, boy. <laughs> I'm thinking of the Thelonious Monk quote that said, writing about music is like trying to dance to architecture, <laughs> therefore talking about music. It's hard to say, but I have to admit that there's a real physical thrill that I experience often when the band is right and when uh, there's a connection first among the musicians, a really special connection among the musicians, and then between the musicians and the audience. I was hoping you could tell all the listeners out there who may want to find out more information about you, how they can access you on the web. Sure. I have a website, Gap Mangione, G A P M A N G I O N E dot com, that has more than you'll ever want to know about me on it. But there are some fun things there. One of which is, first of all, you can order any of the recordings that I've done from there, and you can hear clips from them there as well. But then there's a section called photos, and these are behind-the-scenes photos that I'm I'm pretty sure that you won't find in in any publications or anything like that. Some family photos. As a matter of fact, there's one of Chuck and me doing what we used to do most in terms of playing together, and that is going over to where my mother was living and playing for her. So there's a picture of the two of us and her at the, at the spinet piano. There's a lot of fun photos there, and I, I, I think you, you might enjoy seeing those. I have two final questions. Yes. One is somewhat lighthearted and the other one's a little more serious. The lighthearted one, what is your all-time favorite meal? Oh, <laughs> well, I'm not sure quite how it would be prepared, but it would definitely be pasta and probably red sauce. <laughs> and then you can either add, well, you can add a number of different things, but that would be the basis of it.
somehow I knew you were going to say pasta. <laughs> <laughs> My last question. Yeah. This broadcast goes out to people all over the world. Hmm. What would you like to say to all the people who are listening? What I would most like to say to the people who are listening to you is that I would love to have them listen to us. I think there's some, I really feel that we've put out some unusual and really good music that I'm pretty proud of, and I would love to have them here. You can hear it a number of different ways. Some of it is on YouTube, but all of it is on my website. Well, sir, thank you so much for this interview. Oh, it's my, been my pleasure. It's a pleasure, and I wish you a good day. Well, thank you, and to you too, Paul.